Hello, New Day. Welcome to our evening meeting, and welcome to Each One, Reach One. Tonight is entitled, Oh, Hell. <laughs> Quick reminder, over the last three weeks, as we've tried to look at a motivation to preach the gospel. Remember, we want each one to reach one. We have a beautiful message, a message about Jesus Christ. We want to communicate to the world. And somehow the experts, I don't know who they are and how it works, the experts have worked out that around 1% of Christians lead other people to Jesus. The rest don't. The, that which is the biggest part of our commission is that which the least amount of Christians do. And so what I want to do over these times is just talk with you around how we can engage people with the gospel in a way that we are not offensive, we tell the truth, and we can be effective under the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And so I just want to remind us quickly of the three motivations I've talked about already that Paul used that motivated him to reach out to lost people. The first one was a response of love. Because God has loved him completely, he's able to, in the overflow of this love, he's able to go and love others, genuinely love others. His second motivation was a sense of obligation. Because he has been saved, because he knows the truth, because his life has changed and he has this good news, he feels obliged to go and reach people who haven't heard this good news. And the third motivation was a sense of excitement. It excites him to preach about Jesus. It's, he gets passionate. When you share about Jesus, your own faith becomes more real. You fall in love more with the Lord. You feel closer to him. When you're communicating his truths, you're often learning more than other people are. Do you remember the fourth one? There was a fourth motivation that kind of led Paul, and it was this, the lostness of people without Jesus. He carried a revelation of what it means for people not to to know Jesus, which unfortunately carries a corollary. And that corollary is a consequence for those who do not know Jesus, for those who are lost. The Bible teaches eternal judgment and condemnation. Now, what do we do knowing this? If you look at it here, um, should our evangelism be motivated by a sense of people on the way to hell? If you think that everyone you know who doesn't know Jesus is on the way to hell, it's easy to get loopy, to get drastic, to wonder what do we do? Um, shouldn't we be running around with warning signs, desperately trying to save people from becoming marshmallows over the bry uh, in hell one day? Should we not be desperately reaching every single person because they've got to know or else they're going to burn, etc.? Two things need to happen. The one is we need to be reasonable in our understanding of hell. And second thing is we need to be reasonable about what people perceive when we talk about the subject of hell. And that's often the elephant in the room is people fear dying. Firstly, they fear how they die. Second thing is what happens thereafter. And that's why there's all sorts of movies about, believe it or not, there is this better place. And when you die, you go to this better place. And it's much better. And you, you go and see all your loved ones. And, but there is this deep-rooted concern in people. What is if the Christians are right. You see, if we're wrong with what everything I'm going to share now, if we're wrong, all we've done is live really good lives on earth, benefited other people, lived for the benefit of others, which is very commendable, and we die and we sleep. If, however, we are right, and we have heard God's word on the subject, the consequences for those who don't listen, the consequences for those who don't turn to Jesus is horrific. Because remember, none of us chose where we would be born, when we would be born, in which season we would be born, the color of our skin, the language we would speak, the culture we would grow up in. We had no say in that. We were thrust upon this earth by a creator who created us for his own purposes. And we need to respond to him as clay responds to the potter because there is an eternal consequence, which is the reason why we were created in the first place, which is for relationship with him. God didn't create us to punish us, to give us a hard time, to rev us. God created us that we may, number one, know the absolute privilege of fellowship with him, and number two, that he may literally bless us out of our socks forever and forever and forever with a joy inexpressible that you can't even perceive right now that becomes ours as a free gift from God just that he can bless us beyond any blessings we could ever imagine forever that is what God's plan has been 
for humanity from the moment he created the first people. But there are consequences to those who say, no, thank you, I don't want that. And so we need to try and understand um, where are we in terms of other people's understanding of hell. First question people ask is this, are lost people really lost in the first place? In our modern age of political correctness, we don't hear too many preachers or references to people being eternally and spiritually lost. People just don't go there. These days we say people are not as far along on their spiritual journey or other such jargon. It's very uncomfortable to use language like lost or sinners or judgment or hell these days. But it was Jesus who called people lost. It was Jesus who said, I am the only way to the Father. There is no salvation outside of Jesus. He said so, not us. I can give you a couple of scriptures. Luke 15 verse 4. So he told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he's lost one of them, doesn't leave the 99 in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? John 14, verse 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The apostles were strong on this. Acts 4, verse 12, and there is salvation in, nowhere, in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. 1 Timothy 2, 5, for there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Very exclusive language. In other words, according to Jesus, according to the apostles, and according to the Bible, there is no other go-between or way to God outside of Jesus. And he's the one that uses the language of lost sinners and hell. We need to be aware of this. There is simply no salvation outside of Jesus Christ. People without Jesus live outside of relationship with God and they are lost. That's what the Bible teaches. And the implications of this is a harsh reality, and it's clear. If people are lost, and I'm one of God's children that is found, I must learn how to kindle a heart for lost people and a love and a desire to see them saved. I, it is my responsibility as a Christian to come before God and allow Him to speak to me and to speak into my heart to give me a heart for people who don't know what I now do know. Remember, any study of Jesus that an impartial person takes, you get someone who's never heard of Jesus, you give them a Bible, and they get to look. They will see in Jesus an incredible man. They will see a brilliant message. They will see a life that did good to all people. Opposition won't come to Jesus because of the things he said and did. Opposition will come from within themselves when they want to go and recommit the first ever sin where people say, I want to be like God. I don't want to be God. I don't want to submit to God, sorry. I don't want to yield to Him. What I want to do is I want to be like Him. I'm telling you now, it takes a work of the Holy Spirit for somebody to literally bow the knee in submission to Jesus and to relinquish control of their lives and to say, Jesus, you are the one that I can depend on. You are the one I look to. We will only ever bow the knee of independence to Jesus through a work of the Holy Spirit. Now remember that because we're going to go there now. now. Lost people matter to God. And he showed it through the sacrifice of his son at an incredible cost. He has an idea of how to view lost people from your heart, from some of the great evangelists of the last 200 years. Samuel Rutherford said, I would lay my dearest joys in the gap between you and eternal destruction when he was preaching. Hudson Taylor says, I would never have thought for, of going to China had I not believed that the Chinese were lost and needed Jesus. D.L. Moody said, if I believed there was no hell, I'm sure I would be back home in America tomorrow. William Booth said, I wish that my Salvation Army workers might spend one night in hell, each one of them, in order to see the urgency of their evangelistic task. An understanding of hell and the ramifications of eternal judgment should genuinely motivate every single one of us, should push us towards a reason as to why we do the things we do. 
second statement that floats around when people talk about the subject of hell is this. Are the lost really bound for hell? Is there really such a thing as an eternal separation from God? A pastor started to preach on the subject of hell. And he asked this question, how many of you want to hear good news today? Of course, being an average congregation, they just looked at him like this. So he responded anyway. He says, here's the good news. And I quote, there is a hell. There is a fiery coming judgment when Jesus, the righteous judge, will come to judge the living and the dead. People without Jesus Christ will suffer as a result of their unpaid for sins. My news is this, hell is a reality. Coming judgment is a reality. By now, the congregation, especially those who don't know Jesus, are looking like us. And he says, so what's the good news? There is definitely a hell, but we don't have to go there. That was his good news. Our sins can be paid for so that we don't need to fear judgment day. In order for the gospel to be truly good news, bad news must also be a possibility. If there's no bad news, then good news is just the news. Then it's not the good news of Jesus, it's just the news. But it is good news because it's the opposite or the corollary to bad news. I want to say this to you. Embracing the good news about Jesus personally, embracing the fact of who he is, the ramifications on us means deliverance from hell, deliverance from judgment, deliverance from the condemnation that our sinful selves deserve before a holy, mighty God. You see, the Bible teaches that separation from God is a reality. That separation from God is actually what hell is. But we all have the opportunity to respond to God in his love through Jesus and then give others the same opportunity that they too can respond to him. Now I want to tell you, there are some Christians who have the opinion that belief about hell is too strong. There must be other options. There must be another way to deal with the subject because they, they, they are horrified by the thought that every person who hasn't submitted their lives to Jesus Christ is now separated from God and in a real place where the presence of God is absent. So this is the kind of arguments people come up with. Number one, hell doesn't exist. Or if it does, no one goes there because God in his mercy makes sure no one goes there. Whether they believe in Jesus or not, God is just too loving to send anyone to hell. This is the, the belief system known as universalism. And what it really is trying to claim is that the basis of everyone's salvation is the death of Jesus on the cross, whether they believe in him or not. They don't need to put faith in him for themselves. They don't need to appropriate his death on the cross. The fact that it happened is enough to get them into heaven. Now, this is a very pleasant option, one must be honest. The problem is it violates every single teaching of the Bible because God gives us a choice. Listen to this. If God saves us, against our wills to get saved. It contradicts the Bible's teaching that we are created as free moral agents who have choices. That's, that's the first one. Hell doesn't exist. The second thing people go with is this. Only really bad people go to hell. Uh, Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin, your next door neighbor, the nice people all go to heaven. Now the obvious problem with this is who gets to decide which one of us is nice enough to get into heaven? And then, of course, how do we determine nice or good people? What do they look like? How do they act? What does the scale of righteousness look like? What determines and who determines the level of niceness to get someone into heaven? And who, again, who determines the level of badness? Is it if you have to have killed so many people or so many or you've done this or you've done that? It's a very slippery slope. And how do you measure your good acts that count towards you to get into heaven? If we rely on God and His holiness and His righteousness to measure our niceness, no one's going to get there. Psalm 130 verse 3 says, If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, if you should remember our sin, O Lord, who could stand? You see, this theory is so nice, but it violates the teachings on God's righteousness, God's justice, and God's holiness. And the fact that His holiness demands a payment for sin. Third thing people come up with is only those who actively reject Jesus go to hell. All the rest go to heaven. 
problem with that one too because it doesn't make sense. It removes the motivation for evangelism. If some people can be saved without turning to a savior, because they didn't reject him, but they didn't accept him either, then why can't everyone be saved the same way? And if, if, uh, if, if someone has never heard the gospel, and hell is only reserved for active Jesus rejectors, doesn't it make more sense then not to tell people about Jesus? Because if you tell them about Jesus, they've got the choice to reject him. If you don't tell them, they don't have the choice, therefore they're going to heaven anyway. You can see how this just doesn't make sense. If we go to those already bound for heaven and preach Jesus to them and they choose then to reject, those going to heaven and now suddenly going to hell, then it makes better, better sense for the church just to stop preaching because far more people can go to heaven that way. So it's, it's ludicrous. There's no good news in that. The fourth thing people say is this. Only those who come into a relationship with God through Jesus as their Savior are the ones getting into heaven. Now, although that sounds very limited and very exclusive, it is what the Bible teaches. It also implies, to put it crudely, that everyone who doesn't believe in Jesus is going to hell. And I mean, Jesus himself said, broad is the road, wide is the gate to destruction. Many find it. Narrow is the road, narrow, small the gate that leads to heaven, and few find it. Those were the words of Jesus himself. And this is consistent with biblical teaching. People do have free wills that do get to choose. And that's what we've got to help them, is give them the news by which they get to choose. C.S. Lewis put it this way when talking about choices. Whether or not we, we will bow to Jesus and say, thy will be done, is the issue. If we don't make this choice, then at the judgment seat of God, he states back to us, you want to live independently of me? Then I grant you your wish. Your will be done. On earth, you said, my will be done, not your will be done. So fine, we're here now. Your will be done, not my will be done. Go into a life outside of my presence for eternity. That's what the Bible calls hell. According to this view, only the death and the resurrection of Jesus satisfies God's holiness and God's justice. People receive God's love as expressed in the sacrificial death of Jesus. So our salvation comes out of what Jesus has done for us. Now that is good news. So now I've got to ask you this as we go towards the closing of this preach, is this, which option do you believe? And I want to say to you as a Christian who wants to share the good news and you think, oh hell, when this conversation starts with somebody, let God's word, not wishful thinking, guide your conversation and guide your ideas. Let me ask this question. Should we hear more about hell? Well, let me tell you this. People are quite happy to discuss topics like the spirit world, Satan, demons, astral traveling, stargazing. But talk to them about Jesus Christ. Talk about hell. Talk about judgment. Talk about damnation. They don't want to know. They don't want to hear you. Do you know that Jesus spoke more about hell than he did about heaven? Someone wisely said this. If one generation neglects the doctrine of hell, the next generation rejects it. So what we neglect to talk about now is what the next generation rejects because they don't see it as being in front of them. Should we talk more about hell? Well, Jesus did. And although the world would tell us it's not politically correct, there's a lot that isn't politically correct right now. Let me say this, for instance. I am all for the fact that black lives matter. I am for the fact that every life matters. But let me say this, how many people who were little lives as embryos are being aborted around the world on a daily basis and nothing is ever said in their millions on a yearly basis? So when we talk political correctness, you need to understand political correctness always chooses a vantage point. It's never fair. There's always an agenda behind it. And so when we talk about hell, we need to understand, and let's open up to the fact we also have an agenda. And our agenda is this. We care enough about people, and we are convinced that saved people go to heaven. We are equally convinced unsaved people go to hell. And that should motivate our discussion, but never in a condemnatory, horrible way towards people, trying to put fear in them. As I said earlier, only the Holy Spirit can convict people and bring them to a place of salvation. So we need to be gentle, we need to be kind, we need to be loving, we need to be understanding in our presentation of the reality of the gospel, which includes the doctrine of hell, 
And when people box against it, please step back, don't argue, and allow the Holy Spirit to lead the conversation in their hearts. None of us can ever get somebody saved. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. Why do we, number four, hardly talk about the subject of hell? I'll tell you why. <clears throat> Perhaps the church doesn't believe in hell quite like they used to. The spirit of our age says either everyone's going to heaven or there isn't a heaven. The word of God says that the righteous judge will separate the, the sheep from the goats, some to everlasting salvation and some to everlasting judgment. That's what the Bible says. Matthew 25, verse 46. Paul writes in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 7, and Paul says, And to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His might when He comes on that day to be glorified in His saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed because our testimony to you was believed. Pluralism says that all ways to God and all ways to heaven are equal. But the Bible teaches, as Paul made very clear here in Thessalonians, that Jesus and his death on the cross is the only acceptable sacrifice to a holy God. Jesus is the ransom, the payment, and the satisfaction of God's judgment. John 1.29 the next day he saw Jesus coming toward him. This is John the Baptist. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Clear statement. Look what Paul wrote to the Thessalonians and to the Romans. 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 9. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Romans 5 verse 9. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. Again, speaking of inten uh, impending judgment. Maybe the big reason we don't talk enough about hell as Christians is because we don't have a sense of judgment, of blame or of accountability. A.W. Tozer said, the vague and tenuous hope that God is too kind to punish the ungodly has become a deadly opiate to the conscience of millions. Someone else said this, when they come under conviction and think that they should take the costly step of repentance, something inside them says, don't worry it's not going to be that bad. We have somehow to convince ourselves that there is a God. Sorry, we have come to convince ourselves that if there is a God, His mercy exists, but His judgment and His righteousness doesn't. That is where people have got to. And this false assurance is scary because it leads to a false confidence which carries eternal consequences. People can say, God loves me. And it's true but it's not the whole truth. So they go, to, they go to John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. And they celebrate John 3, 16, but they don't go two verses down to John 3, 18. Whoever believes in Him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's only Son. It's right there. John 3.36, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. You see, what the spirit of this age does is it abrogates any sense of responsibility. We're never to blame. It's not our fault. Our bad behavior either comes from bad genes coming out of a bad family or unpleasant circumstances beyond our control. Whatever happens, it's not my fault. It's always someone else's fault. 
And you know what we do? We want God, the world, wants God to be merciful to us regardless of what we've done, no matter how we respond to Him and no matter how we treat His creation. God must just be forgiving and kind. God must just turn a blind eye. No one else ever does. Norman Giesler said this, In this pluralistic age, hell seems too harsh a punishment just for believing the wrong thing. And that has permeated the hearts and the minds of people. If anything, the overwhelming reality of impending judgment should move us toward greater efforts of outreach, especially for us who are Christians, because we know what's sitting on the table. We've heard people say, no one should hear the gospel twice before everyone has heard it once. There may be a point to that. It's the heart of Romans 15, verse 18. For I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to bring the Gentiles to obedience by word and deed, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and all the way around to Illyricum, I have fulfilled the ministry of the gospel of Christ. And thus I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named, lest I build on someone else's foundation. Paul was brilliant at just wanting to get this gospel to people who've never heard. You know, the gospel is spreading at a rate that's unbelievable, unprecedented. Yet the best gospel experts are telling us that between two and three of the five billion people on planet Earth have never heard the message of Jesus Christ. The gospel of hell should touch us at a very, very deep level. It should mobilize the church toward the task of evangelism. That's why I have said before that the each one reach one that New Day needs to hold on to is the fact that people need to hear the gospel. And right now during this time of of lockdown when everything from casinos to schools and everything in between is clamoring to be open, the church is closed. The prophetic faith community is the most silent. We should be visibly declaring our faith, giving opportunities for people to come and hear the gospel. We should be sharing Jesus with others. We should be praying over people's lives. Thank God this far, every one of the people who've tested positive for COVID in our wider New Day congregation, every single one of them is either healed or totally on the way to full healing. God has been good to us. We need to, by faith, be ministering to people. And when they see the reality of Jesus and they turn to him, Their eternal destiny is assured. We as a church need to own in our hearts the fact that people need to hear about Jesus Christ. Maybe we don't hear about hell because we've lost a sense of the majesty of God. Perhaps too many Christians, as well as the world, has begun to to see God as nothing more than a kindly old grandfather in the sky depicted by the world as Father Christmas, Santa Claus, who plays rockabye baby with us on his lap, who tells us everything is going to be all right, who looks after us in every new way, no matter what we've done and no matter what we get up to. Where did we get this idea? Who decided that God's like this? I'll tell you what's happened. The world has made God in their image to appease their own consciences. We project upon God what we want him to be like. But the Word of God, the Bible, is God's self-revelation. It tells us quite a lot about what God is like. It tells us a lot about what humanity is like. And it tells us a lot about where we're going. Surely we've all heard of the funny guy who says, I don't want to go to heaven. I want to go to hell because that's where the party is. That's where my friends are going to be. One of of my favorite tunes contains lyrics that are horrible. It's Highway to Hell by ACDC. And he talks about heading on the highway to hell to where the party is, to where his friends are. Do you know they couldn't be more wrong if they tried? The Bible says that hell is a matter of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Six times in Matthew and once in Luke, Jesus mentions these words. Gnashing of teeth and weeping. It might not be the literally fire pouring upon people like the, the, uh, the great serpents and the false prophet and the beast are going to have in the f- flaming sulfur of hell. But certainly there will be much gnashing of teeth and weeping at regret that they're living a life without the existence and the presence of God, whereas they were given the opportunity. I'm telling you, the anger will not be so much at God as it will be towards themselves. But for you and I, there will be nothing but the glorious experience of eternity with Him. 
The Bible says in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 10 that those whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life will be thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, tormented day and night forever and ever. Hell is not a party. The worst part of hell is that it is absolutely the absence of the presence of God. God, who is all light and love and beauty and purity. Imagine a place without a single fruit of the Holy Spirit. No love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, mercy, self-control, gentleness. Imagine a place without any of those attributes. That's hell. It's the place of the absence of God. And the Bible teaches it's a very real place. Who goes there ultimately? Those who don't want God in this life presently. Why? They've been blinded. We all commit the first sin, wanting to be like God instead of bowing the knee to God. A God who is much bigger and much greater than us. A God who is able to bring us into a life on this earth where his kingdom comes. Where we experience righteousness, joy, and peace in this life. And joy everlasting when we go to be with him. Friends, because you and I are convinced of this message. Because we know the reality of hell. Let's redouble our efforts and our hearts to tell people the glorious message of Jesus that they may respond to him. Let me pray. Father, it is our prayer as a church that you would touch our hearts, that we would love you enough and we would love people enough to communicate your truth with them. Give us opportunities and give us grace to speak with gentleness, love, and kindness the message of Jesus Christ that we would see a harvest of souls in the next seasons of New Day's life. Help us obey the Great Commission, Lord, to go into all the world and preach the gospel and make disciples. Help us as a church to honor you in everything we do. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Perhaps you one who's actually watched this, you've listened to this, and you've said, I need help. I want to respond to Jesus Christ. The Bible says if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you confess with your mouth that he is Lord, Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, you will be saved. Because the Holy Spirit will do a work in your life. You can pray right now to the Lord Jesus Christ to forgive you your sin. And you can give your life to him. You can receive him as your Lord and Savior right now. On your own. As many of us have done. Another thing you can do is you can get hold of New Day Church. Just look at our, our website. There's a telephone number on their phone there. Tell them that's what, that's what I want to do. And if someone picks up the phone, they'll pray with you. If it's after hours, what we'll do is we'll give your number to somebody who will get hold of you personally and pray with you. And now that we're going to be opening meetings, we'll be able to disciple you. We'll be able to minister to you, spend time with you. There's never been a time like now to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us know if this message has affected you positively. God bless you.